when there's something wonderful to be done. If you're not right there with me, then get out of the way. Most people would not know who Jeremiah Tower is. He was on the front of magazines. He was known all over Europe. We hadn't seen his kind before. He was a natural. A superstar. And this was a chef. He certainly is considered a father of the American cuisine. We should know who changed the world. We should know their names. 1972, Jeremiah Tower walks into Chez Panisse. It was Alice Waters' little dream restaurant. The first thing they did is celebrate local ingredients. I wrote the menu, the California Regional Dinner. It exploded. Complete reevaluation of not just American food and ingredients, but food. Then all hell broke loose, you know. Alice showed me the first book, the Chez Panisse cookbook, and she had taken all the dinners I had dreamed up, written the menus for, and cooked, and said that she did it. I'm not coming back. He became something bigger. Jeremiah at Stars defined what a modern American restaurant could be. It was, at one point, arguably the best in the world. It was just odd that he burned so bright and then just disappeared. He never made contact again. I don't even think any of us knew for sure what had happened. All of a sudden, there was a tweet from the New York Times saying Jeremiah Tower announced his new chef at Tavern on the Green. My first reaction was, holy Here's a guy who's been out of the profession for 15 years. Just seemed like something you'd see in a movie. He's got ranks of critics waiting to ambush him. Look at that. That's inexcusable. He has no clue what he's doing. These look tired. They're horrible. There's clearly unfinished business. Do I think that it's going to be a home run? <sighs> this will never work. If anything is worth doing, it's worth doing in style and on your own terms and nobody else's. Give it up one more time for the legend Jeremiah Tower sitting on this stage. Let's hear it. Even just in this trailer, there's the line that he had unfinished business. Jeremiah, did you feel like you had unfinished business when you set out making this documentary or when you agreed to have a documentary be made about you? No, I was just reacting that I couldn't possibly say no to Anthony or Lydia. You know, as I said this morning, I mean, if the Iranian government couldn't say no to him, how could I? You know? <laughs> that was it. No one says no to Anthony. Yeah, Bourdain. I was just too <laughs> terrified not, you know, to say no. Anthony, did it feel like a piece of unfinished business for you? Yeah, I, I, I think um, really the inspir I read uh, Jeremiah's memoir, uh, originally titled California Dish, and um, it made me realize first how much of my own career had been spent unwittingly cooking food that was directly either created by or influenced by uh, Jeremiah. How many of the uh, how many of the restaurants I'd worked in were were built along the stars uh, uh, template. Um, but I felt a sense of uh, outrage uh, and a need to correct the record when it was just abundantly clear that, that the received history of the American food revolution had, had, had managed to write, willfully written him out. Uh, you know, it was like those old Soviet pictures where there's Trotsky and suddenly he's not there. You know, there's, <laughs> there's Lenin and Stalin waving, but you know, Trotsky was originally in the picture, has been airbrushed out. Jeremiah, and, you're our Trotsky. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I, I felt a need to, 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 a desire to correct the record. And I think that was the original impetus. But of course, as with all film projects or all stories, it, may, it starts out to be about one thing, and it is about that. But it, as I got to know Jeremiah and met him and we started to make the film, it became clear that, that this is a, you know, a, a great character-driven uh, personal story about an incredible life and an incredible talent. Now, Jeremiah, when, when you're a celebrity of, of some kind, you know everybody has an opinion about you and your career, and Anthony clearly has an opinion about your place in the history of food. Did you have this opinion of yourself as well? Did you feel willfully written out of the, the, the history? Well, you know, when Liddy was first interviewing me, and, and she said, you know, talking about Alice, and I sort of was too relaxed, and she kept repeating it and repeating it, and I said, okay, I am pissed off. I'm, you know, I had to build myself up to it, because there's a certain point when you just forgive everything. I mean, when you get to my age, I mean, if you haven't relaxed about a lot of that stuff, uh, there's something wrong. 
But uh, after an hour with Lydia, I, I got really pissed off again, you know. <laughs> just reading any bad review right. that you could have ever got. Absolutely, just yeah. In your face. So, uh, but it was a very interesting thing because as we talked about it more and more, you know, and then I saw that, my career, in a completely different way. I mean, I'd never sort of inspected myself like that before, so it was fascinating. And it's made a great film. Well, Lydia, as the director, you know, you've, uh, you've worked on Anthony's show before, and you, you've, you've worked on a number of food shows. What did you find when you first started making this film that totally changed your mind about it and sort of changed the direction? Yeah, I mean, I read the book, too. Um, it's reprinted as yeah. Start the Fire, so it's a fantastic read. Um, he's a great writer, very tr tremendous anecdotes. And, um, you know, I thought when I read the book it would be an interesting biopic about you know, an important chef who had a great impact on, on the way we eat and the way, that, where we eat and restaurants. But I, you know, when I met him and started interviewing him, I, I realized there was something actually deeper and more robust. It was really sort of a, a story about um, someone who had a tremendous artistic, you know, impulse and, and, uh, and had to express that and, and you know, I think like every great story, he's someone who has uh, amazing things to be celebrated and like every great hero, you know, tragic flaws <laughs> that were uh, somewhat uh, part of his undoing. And I think that's Absolutely. what became... <laughs> I think that's what became interesting. It, it was sort of beyond just a chef story. It was really the story of, you know, uh, an artistic person. I, I think, um, you know, Jeremiah... Uh, uh, is largely responsible for the way restaurants look and feel today, uh, for the celebration of America, for identifying, writing menus that celebrate American, uniquely American products. This really didn't, uh, though it had been done in a small scale, this was really a tectonic event. Um, he was largely responsible for the power shift from the front of the house to the chef, meaning nobody gave a shit what the chef thought before. Uh, chefs, if you imagined a chef, he was a servile uh, European who looked like Chef Boyardee and the last person you wanted to see in the dining room and definitely the last person you wanted to ask for an opinion on what you should eat. You went in and you demanded what you wanted and the chef's job was to, to do that. Um, you know, I joked that, that, uh, that uh, Jeremiah was the first fuckable chef um, and there's a great clip in this. It's my favorite moment in the film is when, Jer when Ruth Reichel describes Jeremiah entering the room, and she's you know practically panting. And this was an important thing for all of us because nobody cared about us before. Never, nobody ever thought about us as someone who with uh, uh, opinions of our own. I mean, of course, chefs know what best what they're good at, and they'd like to tell you. They're proud of what they do the ability to tell that story to the customers and you know, the willingness to listen to it was largely due to what Jeremiah accomplished. He was the first chef who customers not only wanted to see in the dining room, they sort of insisted on seeing him in the dining room. And that was a big, big thing for the whole chef-driven restaurant, the chef-driven menu, and the way we eat today. Uh, meaning, you know, you don't go into a Mario Batali restaurant and say, you know, I really feel like some spaghetti and meatballs. You, you go in and you, you're eager to hear what's Mario doing at this particular restaurant? What is this restaurant about? I want to hear someone talk to me. Yeah, I mean, I would just add to that, we take the whole notion of celebrity chef for granted nowadays because it's so ubiquitous. But, you know, that was, as Tony said, a real turning point where chef became kind of central superstar. And... Um, you know, many argue he was, Jeremiah was one of the first celebrity chefs. Well, now people go into becoming a chef, not everybody, but a lot of people go into becoming a chef initially to build a brand. They start off with what is my brand going to be? Not no, that's tragic. I, I mean, if you, you roll right out of cooking school with a signature haircut, you know, there's something <laughs> seriously wrong with you. And, and it happens. I mean, you, you, you do but, any of the judge, cooking shows, you know, you go on as a judge and like every one of these goofs has a, has a sort of a unique, like, you know, uh, faux hawk or, you know, you know. I mean, the faux hawk is tragic in and of itself. Yeah, already. It's like but, Tony, this is your fault. 
you know. I think we both have a lot to answer for. We do. <laughs> Judgment. Well, Jeremiah, Jeremiah I, I'm curious. Were you aware of at the time that you were building a brand, that you were becoming a celebrity chef? Did you exploit that? I mean, and I don't mean that in a pejorative way, but did you exploit what it seemed like you were building and sort of build off of that? Or did it seem like it was just kind of coming based off of what you were already doing that you loved? Well, you know, in hindsight, looking back at it now, for all of you who are not my age, it, it seems ridiculous and not true for me to say that, you know, at Chez Panisse days, so, you know, 72 to 78, uh, we had, I had no idea. That's what I, I had no consciousness of that. I was just trying to fill up the restaurant. We were broke. We had no money. You know, some days there was veal on the menu and I had to change it to chicken because we couldn't afford the veal. And so my thrust, you know, was to fill the restaurant. So I started using PR and, you know, certain outrageous activities to get the press to take notice and to get James Beard to write uh, in his articles, 100 newspapers in America saying, you know, there were four restaurants that he wanted to go back to and he named three that everybody knew about and then Chez Panisse and everyone went, who? And then of course, then everyone asked, you know, and, and took notice. But in the beginning, no, that was just, it was just um, filling up the restaurant. I'm going to make you uncomfortable for a minute. I mean, one of the things that Anthony brought up was what Ruth says about you in the film. But somebody also says that when you walked into a room, everybody in the room, man or woman, wanted to sleep with you. Were you aware of that charisma and how that could be used to tap into building a restaurant? I've been aware of that since I was 12. <laughs> <laughs> and used it all I could. <laughs> but certainly, uh, it became apparent to me, you put on clean whites and go out into that big dining room with a glass of champagne in your hand. And you can look at the looks on people's faces, you know, and think, oh, I've got this audience, you know. So, yes, of course, I was. And now we talk about uh, celebrity chefs, and there's, there's, you know, competition cooking shows with, where little kids are cooking. And I think that's definitely something that's sort of totally born out of how cooking has become this mainstream pop culture thing. But in your book, you were studying and saving and creating menus at the age of seven. Is that, can you talk about that? Well, you know, I, incredible. Well, because I grew up on, I mean, I was traveling a lot with my family and going on wonderful things like the Queen Mary, you know, and the menus would come to the table and they were that big, you know, and they had 100 items on them or something. Most of, the, a lot of them are cold from the cold buffet. And so I would, it was a challenge to uh, find your way through it. And I just took, it was a challenge for me to, to show to my parents that I knew what I was doing. So then they took on a whole life of their own with me as a private life. So, I mean, sounds weird, doesn't it? <laughs> and of course it was weird, but that's how it happened. I mean, I, I think this is one of the, the fascinating aspects of the film and interviewing Jeremiah is he's talking about this like a marvelous golden childhood, right? Looking at these menus. This was a young man, a, a boy, who, however comfortable financially, grew up alone left on his own in these vast, empty luxury hotels that his parents often forgot he was even in, um, on ocean liners and uh, you know luxury cruises and empty hotels where his only companions were the waiters, the cooks, the hotel staff, and the menus, which he would read and, and, and imagine and dream and gave him this remarkable and really eerie ability to read particularly old menus from uh, from the 20s and earlier, and imagine what the room was like and who might have been in the room, what they were wearing, as his capacity to imagine um, it, a whole world just by reading a menu is scary brilliant. Which leads me to ask, Jeremiah, have you sold your life story to Wes Anderson yet? Because it no. sounds exactly like a Wes Anderson <laughs> no, movie. No, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that I love that you do in the in the film is that you 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 sort of start exploring not just his philosophy behind food, but how his philosophy of style and life itself started affecting the food. When did that start becoming a part of the film for you? I mean, I think very early on. I've, if you you know, originally the film was sort of broken down into three acts, which you know we explore the early childhood and then the shape and years and then stars. And when you look at the early childhood, you realize that despite the moneyed neglect. You know, he was ensconced more often than not in, in pretty incredible experiences of travel and restaurants. And so that, you know, that was very much part of his formative years. And of course, that would impact, you know, his vision later on. I mean, he never studied cooking formally, never went to culinary school, never did anything formal in the kitchen, steps into Chez Panisse, 
And you know, what does he have readily at his fingertips? But you know, the books that he had read on cooking Escoffier and Toklas, um, and then of course all of those experiences as a, as a child. So it was it was important, I think, to kind of anchor the film in that sort of early childhood experience because that's really what came to play, you know, later on in his career. Jim, I, I fell in love with first class at, at an early age. And first class is not a bad model if you're trying to you know, get someplace and, and know what to do. So um, in the film, there's that amazing recreation of the consomme. I'm here I'm by myself on a big ocean liner crossing the Atlantic in winter. It's freezing bloody cold. And I'm on a deck chair because it needed the fresh air so it wouldn't throw up. And you know, a steward comes along with a blanket and wraps my legs in the blanket. My name is on the back of the, of the uh, deck chair and he has a trolley with a big urn of hot consomme and a beautiful Limoges cup, you know what I mean? It's all those, and they re recreate that wonderfully in the film because I can still remember that tinkle over there. Well, it's not a tinkle, it's a china, beautiful first-class china sound, pouring the consomme and then drinking the consomme and thinking, oh God, I'm not gonna throw up. This, I am in love with first class. <laughs> And, oh, go ahead, Anthony. When, we've, when I first read the book and I started to think about what this thing might look like, I remember our earliest conversations, I'm thinking those, th that, that sort of almost fetishism of, of a fine uh, hotel and restaurant linen, uh, you know, full silver service laid out, uh, fine china, Baccarat crystal, as a substitute for, you know, your parents' love and attention. Uh, that dynamic was really interesting to me. And I know we talked a lot about hands moving over linen and, and uh, the, the, you know, the sort of distort, frankly, distorted uh, appreciation of those things uh, that, that, that a lonely child would, would develop. And I, I, that was fascinating to me and, and familiar to me as well. I mean, I, I you know, a big, a big experience for me as a kid was, you know, Queen Mary, and I remember that consomme, and, um, you know, it, it it's a, changes your, your worldview. Jeremiah, one of the most, uh, I think, thrilling sequences of the film is when you sort of come out of semi-retirement and start working at a tavern on the green, and you try to do this incredible thing there, which is essentially sort of turn a, turn a tourist spot into a first class spot and you find it to be much harder than I think you, you, you thought it would be and they kind of turn against you. I'm curious, do you regret that, that challenge at all, taking on that challenge? No, I mean, uh, turning it around, I mean, using the metaphor of the Queen Mary, it was like trying to turn the Queen Mary around in a storm, you know, and we almost got there before it veered off again. Uh, do I regret it? No. I forget who it was, but somebody I read recently said that, you know, your measure is the chances you take, the measure of your life, uh, the chances you take. And I love that, you know. And I have a fatal attraction for the slim chance, so. <laughs> <laughs> and that was definitely one of them, yeah. Was this the slimmest? This was about the slimmest, and I hadn't, t I hadn't talked to uh, Tony before. I took it on, otherwise I wouldn't have. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would have said no chance. It, yeah, it's yeah. famously a chef killer. Um, it's... Uh, you know, if you've ever been, you know, it's a great restaurant to bring your, you know, your, your aunt or your grandmother from out of town. It's a, you know, it's tourists only. New Yorkers would, no New Yorker would admit to going there unless you're taking your grandmother out and you don't want to see anybody you know because you can be sure you won't at Tavern on the Green. The, the volume alone is the sort of thing that breaks any, any chef. The sacrifices and, uh, uh, you know, the concessions you have to make to doing, you know, 700 meals uh, a day, uh, that's very, very, very tough. And I, the, the thought of somebody who's lived their whole life in pursuit of uh, uh, excellence uh, and fabulousness and glamour uh, and style and tavern on the green, those two things just did not go together for me. I would just add to that that tavern was never anticipated as part of the film, because it happened right. actually quite late in the process. So, you know, the film was actually veering towards a rough cut when, you know, he, Jeremiah didn't tell me he took the job. He had already moved to New York City. The film was already you know, finished. We thought we were, yeah. And then all suddenly, you know, it, it kind of, it, everyone was talking about it. It was a headline that he had taken the job. And 
that point, I nearly wanted to choke him to death because I thought he was, you had to he's ruining of, the film. Really? You had to kind of know, though, because Tavern on the Green is, and he said it's sort of famously hard to turn around that it was going to make for... No, a Lydia, Lydia totally, she'd call me every day. You know, first he said, what do I do now? I mean, we're going to have to make a whole other additional movie. And I said, don't worry, this will be over real quick. Um, and, and, but, but she called me every day and said, no, but he's, he's doing really well. The food is getting better. It's, it's going to happen. It's coming together. I said, Lydia, it's going to be over any week. <laughs> um, you know, Did you tell Jeremiah that? No. Uh, no, we but I mean, I've, seen, I, I've known other chefs who took that that gig. So, and I'm I was intimately aware of the, uh, you know, I've done volume, uh, those kinds of numbers, and you know, I know it does does the soul. I, I, I you know, I it, it it rolled out pretty much as uh, as as I imagined it would. And these I'm, two guys, what did they do before? Oh, on the I green? mean, I, first they of all, I'm, I'm stubborn enough. shop in, in Philadelphia. No, 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 let's right? not, let's not bet. Yeah, they're complete they, they, morons. It's, it's an iconic restaurant. <laughs> it's in the, you know. Allegedly. It's a, Inept morons. No, no, no. My, my, my favorite the, part of the film is when you're recounting sitting in a meeting with them and you say to yourself, what am I doing listening to these fucking losers? And you throw everything away. It's like, I like the moment, so they, they, Jeremiah notices that they're not serving cocktail napkins with the cocktails. And ask the waiter, well, do you have cocktail? You know, the waiter says, uh, yeah, or the manager, right? The general manager, yeah. yes, we'll have to take that up at the next meeting in a few days. Is well, do you, do you have cocktail napkins on? Yes, we do. But whether or not to serve the said cocktail napkins with the cocktail was apparently something that needed to be discussed at some future date rather than make sure they have fucking cocktail <laughs> napkins. And well, one of the... Uh... A week before the New York Times review, which was um, mas o menos, as we say in Mexico, um, <laughs> in other words, bloody awful, uh, they had taken me out to dinner to get to know me and talk about the future of the food for the rest of the year. And the chef of the partnership said, is it true that lamb has both white and dark meat? And I thought he was joking, so I said, I mean, how could he be asking me that question? I thought he was joking, so I said, only if it has feathers. And they, they got really pissed off. So uh, <laughs> a week later, um, then we had this big meeting where they said, OK, the New York Times Review had come out, and, and it wasn't favorable. They said it was embarrassing to them because how, how, what would their children's, the parents of the other children, when they took their kids to school, think of them? And I'm thinking, you, we're about to add 350 seats to this restaurant for the summer season, and you're worried about the opinion of the parents at school? Um, and they said, well, we want to make the food guarantee that the food will be perfect. And I thought, okay, uh, white meat and lamb, they're going to guarantee the, the food is going to be perfect. I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> this that. is way too slim a chance for me. Uh, Anthony, you know, since, since you wrote your first book and, and, and you've gotten some shows, you know, and you've gotten a fair amount of popularity, a lot of popularity, I would say, and you've been able to build your own brand, whether intentional or not. I know it's a horrible word, and I apologize for using it. Um, what is it like now to be able to use that, though, to sort of retell the story of, of Jeremiah Tower, like to sort of use it for, yeah. for good? Um, look, uh, I don't have a brand. I am stumbling through life taking advantage of certain opportunities that present themselves and and ignoring other ones. Uh, this, I saw an opportunity to tell a story that I felt strongly about. Um, there was something about Jeremiah's story that pressed my justice button um, in an evangelical way. Look, I'm one of those people, if I read a book that I really, really like, uh, and I had the time, I would you know, get a big stack of those books and go to like everybody's house that I knew, pound on the door, show them the book, and then make them read it in front of me. Um, I, I feel that strongly about certain books and uh, movies and records and stories. I'm annoying that way. Um, here I saw an opportunity to uh, tell a story in a powerful visual way, and of course I knew who, to, who, who, who could you know, make that happen, uh, Lydia and uh, uh, creative partners at uh, Zero Point Zero. So um, it just it felt like a, a, the right thing to do, a fun thing to do, a good thing to do, and one that would be creatively satisfying. Turn it over to the audience for some questions. Who has a question? Right here. Hi, guys. Um, I was wondering, uh, like, for each of you, uh, what you think maybe some of the more newer and upcoming chefs could take away or learn from from the the documentary. 
Um, I don't want to, I can't think of like any chefs I want to mention by name in particular, but I would say that um, a lot of eyes around the world are looking at Mexico and reevaluating Mexican food and starting to realize that this is a lot older, deeper, way more nuanced and sophisticated cuisine than we might have realized previously. And, and you know, maybe we're willing to actually pay the money that, that should be spent on, on, I mean, some of these sauces, uh, some of those, the more complex moles, that's, uh, they're so labor intensive and use so many ingredients. Um, I think I'll, that is a trend and a direction that I think is uh, important. You know, not just uh, looking at Mexican food, but reevaluating, uh, reexamining how much it's worth, because right now it, it's expected that Mexican food should be cheap. Not so. And I would just add to that that, you know, in studying Jeremiah's history, you know, he basically took something that had been working very well and and for a long time in Paris, you know, these beautiful big Parisian brasseries. And he, you know, he understood that model and studied it, and he brought it to San Francisco in a very new and fresh way. So he had a very deep understanding of historically what came before him. And in some ways, he was, you know, re-imprinting something that had been around for so long, but he he added this whole other layer of a, of a kind of American style on it. So, it, you know, he was drawing from the past, and so understanding and 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 you know, studying the past certainly helps with future. And I think one of the lessons is that you know you can do whatever you want to, um, and you don't have to follow uh, the current trend or the magazines. You know, you can go now and have a plate of food. It'll be in Sydney or in Hong Kong or Tokyo, or Toronto, or Los Angeles, New York, San Francisco, and it all looks the same. You know, dot, 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 dot. And that, like, somebody took a cat's ass and smeared carrot puree across the plate. You know, that one. Why? Why, why, why? Do you ha everyone have to do that? That's not, doesn't, isn't proof that you're a serious cook, chef, restaurateur. Um, and I'll just tell a funny story about, you know, the in inspiration for the brasserie, because that kind of restaurant is the one you can go to three or four times a week, not once a month, and that's what I, what I wanted. I walked into Beaufanger, a big brasserie in, in Paris one night, looking for ideas of what this restaurant I was going to do. And there were two models sitting at the front table, absolutely gorgeous, absolutely, you know, model thin. And there was an enormous seafood service, four tiers of enormous trays of ice and covered with uh, shellfish and everything and lobsters and crab, everything, sea urchins. And they had long red Elizabeth Arden, you know, carmine fingernails, and they were digging the crab meat out of the crab and then pulling it across their tongue. And I went, I want a restaurant just like this. <laughs> so that's what I did. Uh, next question. Jeremiah, uh, my question would be on a personal level as a chef, from what do you derive your greatest challenges and pleasure? Challenges, you mean as an in inspiration or? Yeah, it's always ingredients. You know, it starts with ingredients, ends up with ingredients. Um, Anthony and I were talking this morning about, you know, chefs that, you know, have world fame and uh, still when the season comes for something special, we were talking about percebes and things like that in, in Galicia, northern Spain. He said it, that our kids, you know, they still get incredibly excited even though they're surrounded by this. Uh, every day for whatever the season is. If you don't have that excitement, then you, you just don't even start, you know, and then you're just fooling yourself and everybody. I was just in Seville, Spain last week, and I went into the market there and I thought, oh my God, I'm moving here next week. I'm getting an apartment with a kitchen so I can cook those little baby, you know, legs of lamb for two, the uh, little cuttlefish, you know, the fava beans that are the size of your little fingernail, uh, already peeled, thank God. Um, yeah, it's ingredients. That's exactly what is the beginning and the end of the story. Chefs are all romantics uh, in a business that crushes any notion of, of any leap of faith. Uh, again and again, your heart is broken and your hopes and dreams uh, uh, and aspirations are smashed. You are, you are, it is proved absolutely again and again and again every day that there's there is 
nothing to be gained by the pursuit of excellence by believing that, that your customers will be as passionate about ingredients as you are, and yet we persist. And one of the things we were talking about is, you know, food porn for chefs. If you're hanging around with a bunch of chefs who've been cooking very sophisticated, expensive, three Michelin star food for their whole careers, what food do they talk about always and get this sort of blissed out, glassy eyed, yearning look? Uh, it's very, very, very simple, simple things. Good bread, good butter, good salt. You know, all of those those uh, red oil. prawn red prawns in uh, you know in the Italy in season. Uh, you know, simple uh, stuff. You know, a simply sauced pasta pomodoro. Bill Buford writes in Heat about how he noticed you know jaded line cooks been cooking their whole lives. They all had something they kind of got off on. Watching, he'd catch them sort of just looking at the little leaves of thyme popping in hot olive oil in the pan. Uh, for a lot of chefs, bread never gets old. You know, bread goes in the oven ugly and nasty and tasting of nothing, and you, it comes out. Wow, how'd that happen? Um, so there's that 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 belief in magic that I think we may try to suppress as chefs, but but it, it creeps up on us just the same. What's yours? What's your thing that, that, that you see, the, like the bread going in the oven or the thyme popping in the, in the pan? I get off on, uh, there's that moment, like I, I, I cooked uh, French food for most of my career, um, so I'm kind of late to Italian, but there's a moment, uh, the pasta's cooked, or, or almost completely cooked. You've made your, or completed your sauce in the pan, um, and there's that moment where you drag the pasta out of the water, into the sauce with a little bit of that starchy water in it, and you start to finish the, 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 the pasta in, in that sauce. And there's this moment where the pasta takes in the, the, the sauce and sort of engorges in a very, you know, you, the sexual metaphors are impossible to avoid. But why, why it, avoid it, it them? does it for me. It does it for me every time. I just, I'll just stand back and I'll say, oh, look at that. Look at that. It's just it's fucking awesome. <laughs> and it is a, it, it's a moment. It's almost like, well, as long as we're going that way, it's orgasm. I mean, you know, it's the beginning. There's that moment when the pasta just does that little... It's a swelling, <laughs> a swelling of the membrane, an there engorgement of the membrane. Yeah, like, <laughs> <laughs> the <Fair> water. <laughs> do, you, do you have something? Or is that... Would I, that be... I was just about just talking of Italy. I mean, there was one of the great moments of revelation to me was, you know, because... <clears throat> You know, when I had no, starting at Cheap we had no money, so I had to go to this Italian restaurant where five course meal was, you know, 4 50 or something. And there was always pasta with tomato sauce. Well, I mean, tomato sauce is always disgusting to me, and I just never understood what that was all about. And then The Godfather, where he's cooking it for five hours, horrible, horrible stuff. But I was taken by this company called Mastro Berardino, who make wines out in Naples on the slopes of Vesuvius. And he went to his little house, and hanging up outside the kitchen door were tomato plants with the tomatoes still on them. And I thought, wow, that's, uh, you know, I mean, it must be a cook who lives here to put this sort of decoration, instead of flowers, they've got tomato plants hanging around. And he said, oh, no, 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 no. That's what a sun-dried tomato is. Though it's not the thing in the package at Whole Foods. It was this perfect, already perfect tomato that had been dried in the sun for three days, four days, just until the water starts to disappear. And then they have they take spaghetti and they just throw the whole tomato in there and toss it around or chop it up and toss it around and that's spaghetti with tomato sauce. Is everyone engorged now? <laughs> I think we have time for one more question. Who's got the microphone right there? Hi, um, this question is for Anthony. Um, being that you're always on the go and trying different cuisines um, internationally, I was just wondering, what is your exercise regimen? Um, I do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu every morning, so I basically travel from, wherever I travel, I go to a gym and uh, somebody half my age uh, uh, tries to choke me unconscious and I try <laughs> really to hard again. to stop that from... <laughs> 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 I try to... <laughs> I try to stop that from happening. Yeah. Um, guys, the film is wonderful. Uh, Jeremiah Tower, The Last Magnificent. How can people see it? Uh, it opens this Friday uh, in New York and L.A. at the Sunshine uh, Landmark. Landmark. 
and then uh, next week in San Francisco, and then it goes nationwide after that. So uh, this Friday, it opens, premieres. Yeah. And Jeremiah's book, Start the Fire, is on shelves now. People can pick it up, right? Yes. Uh, yes. Highly recommend it. It was the impetus for the film, so it's a great read. Awesome. Guys, thank you so much for being here. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.